Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Advancement Live. My name is Ryan Catherwood. I'm coming to you live from the grounds of the University of Virginia here in beautiful Charlottesville, Virginia. It's Tuesday, 1 p.m., so thank you once again for putting Advancement Live on your calendars. I hope you have a nice brown bag lunch in front of you and you're excited for a really good show today. Advancement Live is a weekly broadcast dedicated to higher ed development, engagement, and communication professionals. We broadcast on the Higher Ed Live Network, which is a product of EdUniverse Media. Make sure to use our back channel, which is hashtag Advancement Live, and we'll try to answer any questions that you have during the broadcast. We have a really cool show today. I'm excited to announce both Tom Dominic and Darren Brabham. But first, let me introduce our sponsor for the show. And let me pull up uh, their awesome logo. That is iModules. iModules Software is the leading constituent engagement management provider for educational institutions. iModules delivers an integrated online platform that transforms how institutions strengthen constituent relationships and achieve fundraising success. All right, so we have a really exciting show today, and uh, what I wanted to do was introduce to you uh, a website that I found, and of course, the digital creator of that website, or at least a collaborator, uh, and he'll talk more about that. But when I was looking for examples of really fantastic uh, campaign websites within the advancement world, I came across Duke, Duke's uh, Duke Forward platform, and Tom Dominic is here to talk about how that website was created from the very beginning, how they've fostered participation, uh, and been able to grow uh, participation both internally and externally. And as sort of part of the strategy of Duke Forward is to grab and curate social content using hashtags and mentions as a component. I wanted to explore the idea of online communities a bit further. The second half of the show is dedicated uh, to a, our, our guest, Darren Brabham, professor of Annenberg School of Communication at, at the University of Southern California. And Darren is a leading expert on crowdsourcing, which is one of my favorite topics. We'll talk with him about what it is, what it is not, and how higher education communicators can perhaps better utilize the idea to address some of their business challenges. So first off, Tom Dominic joins us, and he is the Director of Digital Communications in Duke University's Office of Development. In that role, he oversees all things digital, that's all things, regarding the university's uh, Duke Forward campaign, including communications through the web, social media, multimedia, email, and other related areas. How's it going, Tom? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Fantastic. Uh, great to have you with us. Let me do want to introduce Darren quick, and then we'll come back uh, to you, Tom. Darren Brabham is the associate, excuse me, the assistant professor at the Annenberg School for Communications and Journalism at the University of Southern California. Uh, he uh, was first to publish scholarly research using the word crowdsourcing uh, in his book, uh, Crowdsourcing from MIT Press, is in its second printing. Hey, Darren, how's it going? Good. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for being here. We appreciate it. So, uh, Tom, for those of us who haven't had a chance to explore Duke Forward yet, uh, can you talk through the creation of the site as it relates to sort of the business goals you were addressing when you when you sought out to create it? Yeah, I can. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so, our campaign, Duke Forward, started last September, September 29th, and before that actually came to a launch day, we spent a lot of time thinking about what we needed to do in communications and lots of different channels. And of course, for us, web was a, was a tremendously big component amongst all digital things. So, knowing we had a September uh, 2012 launch day, we looked at this, you know, at least a year ahead of time, and knowing we needed a lot of different pieces to come together. We spent quite a bit of our early months talking about what the goals should be, how we'd discover things uh, to include in the site, and how we'd kind of um, identify what, what we wanted to do in the coming months. And we came back around to the idea that we wanted something a little bit new. Uh, we'd looked around and seen things that we liked, but felt like we wanted to kind of approach it from a different direction than what we had seen other places. And one of our challenges with it actually in, in, in specific was the idea that we wanted a site that was able to portray how the campaign and how Duke Ford was going to impact all different parts of the university. And, and for us, 
the idea of how you do that in one website uh, was was daunting to begin with, and and we just sort of dove in ultimately with this mantra of how are we going to provide windows into Duke Forward through lots of different sort of places. And that, that's kind of how we started the process. And I think that's one of the things that becomes sort of pretty apparent when you take a look at Duke Forward is, is uh, the, obviously the research and analysis and um, consideration that you guys put into it, perhaps pro clearly prior to the development of the site. And I know in our you know, discussions before uh, for the show prep, you actually talked about uh, working with an agency partner for the design. Uh, and um, that was a, a really a positive, collaborative uh, process. Can you talk a little bit more about that experience? Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, so any site like this of this magnitude for us, we knew we couldn't do it by ourselves. And we knew that we had a lot of issues tied into it in terms of just campaign branding and things that had to do with just getting the campaign identity put together. So we knew pretty quickly that we'd have to work with at least an agency resource to get sort of the, the, the rough ideas in place. And um, to that end, we spent a lot of time uh, sort of identifying groups around the country and places that we felt could have sort of a fresh approach, um, might do something different that's outside of an educational realm, and might bring to the table some sort of horsepower in terms of not just design or identity, but also technical aspects. Because we we have, and I have a sort of developer or two on staff, but in general, it was probably a bigger nut than we could just handle by ourselves, uh, knowing what our ambition was in terms of just how to put this together. So we, we were very lucky in, in, in working with an agency uh, that was able to kind of provide a really close working relationship in terms of technical, as technical aspects of the site over and above the design. So I really felt like we had like a cross-country team between here and New York in terms of getting the thing put together. We just... Uh, we just uh, had lots of sort of phone calls like this, hangouts, and just sessions where we hammered out lots of details, had lots of exploration, had lots of discovery, and fortunately we're exposed to lots of technologies that helped us kind of achieve what we wanted to do in terms of just, you know, like a forward-looking approach, for lack of a better way to put it. And uh, I think we got very lucky that it worked out very smoothly for us. I think one of the... the one of the obvious components of Duke Forward is the, the challenging uh, technical aspect in which you guys are curating, collecting, and showcasing a lot of social content. Uh, you guys are also um, using your own internally produced content, uh, advertising various components of the campaign, its initiatives, the opportunities uh, for funding on that site. Can you talk about as it was developed and, and then rolled out, you know, what was the process since it was re heavily reliant on social content? How do you encourage alumni and other constituents to engage in that? Yeah. Uh, so back to one of our original goals was this idea of windows into the campaign and what does Duke Ford mean to anybody who may be interested in the university, being a student, uh, alumni, an affiliate, a friend. and all that information, you know, w w had to be kind of aggregated in a way that we felt would be engaging and, and accessible at the same time. So, you know, it was kind of a two-pronged approach for us. We felt, okay, we've done a lot of content and a lot of things sort of in other channels and other media that had to do with the priorities of Duke Ford and the ideas behind what the campaign would be about. So to go forward with that, we felt like it would be very uh, serendipitous for us to kind of not only present that information in an interesting fashion, but kind of turn it inside out almost and say, okay, here is what we're talking about the campaign is about. What is the greater community doing today, this minute, this instance that really reflects what the campaign is doing? So for us, what happened was outside of beyond just the donation and clicking on a make a gift button, we started to identify sort of social media content as kind of a different kind of currency, almost like an engagement currency. And that drove a lot of what our thinking was in terms of how we would use social media. Because I think like anybody works today, social media is something you don't ignore, uh, obviously, but it's also could be a tough nut to integrate into something that's not, you know, something that's in a social media realm like Facebook. So we tried to blend together uh, this idea of people tweeting, uh, people using Instagram, which was fairly kind of, you know, just burgeoning at the time, uh, people using uh, Facebook posts, and how do we put this all together 
and, and, and say, okay, engagement is a currency. You may not come to a site today just to click that Make a Gift button, but you may come to the site and serendipitously find out something about energy or serendipitously find out something about law, which ultimately may can we bring you back around to wanting to participate in a way or, or make a gift you know, on another visit. So it was kind of a, a combination of all this, and, and that was sort of our, our, our direction when we started to integrate everything together on our uh, sort of Duke Ford homepage. Does that sort of get at what you're thinking? Yeah, yeah, it does. And I think, so obviously, uh, one component of a campaign website and what you guys have there at Duke Forward is sort of a representation of all the various uh, funding initiatives, opportunities, uh, and are you able to interact with all of those opportunities from a social level? Uh, and as you sort of mentioned, um, uh, the various communications professionals internally and probably some externally who are recognizing what you guys are doing there. But because you guys are working as a representative of the entire university and a large spectrum of giving opportunities, um, I have to imagine you've, you've really worked hard to collaborate uh, around the university with other uh, professionals who are trying to uh, make sure the, the site functions to attract donors to those specific initiatives. H how does the site support the other schools and units around Duke and, and perhaps how are you interacting with uh, some of the people around the university? Yeah, uh, good question and the answer is, is quite a bit. Um, when we started the process of putting together our sort of framework for the site itself and uh, explored sort of the technology we could use uh, with with our partners and I should say the agency we use was Sullivan in New York City uh, they were great partners for us we started to understand that you know this windows into the campaign idea would be fairly encompassing in terms of how we could present information so uh, if one looks at our website, which we'll look at a little bit later in our discussion, the idea of our homepage really centers on this idea that you as a, as a visitor or a user can kind of filter content or look at this sort of tile content of our homepage through any of these windows. And we've got sort of a fairly tappable interactive filter bar on there that says, oh, here are the 23 or 24 different schools, units, or priorities that Duke Forward is about or will impact. And if you want to see how the Fuqua School of Business, for example, is impacted by Duke Forward, you can sort of filter content on our homepage by your own sort of choice and see all the things that not only created content we, we, we posted about Duke Forward, but things that maybe socially generate content that relate to Fuqua that, that uh, kind of ties it back into the big picture of Duke Forward. So, so to get that accomplished, um, it was really sort of a credit to not only the digital aspects of our communications team, but all the people on our content team, of which we have a few, to help create not only the print materials, but to start to generate and translate a lot of what was happening sort of in our print campaign materials to website content. And it almost became this idea that once we've got the print materials done, now we've got the website we built the house, how do we start putting the, the content in to these sort of filtered states of the site that reflect you know, the schools, the units, or these sort of areas of priority within the campaign. So a lot of the legwork that we did in terms of the other channels really jump-started and got us ahead of the game in terms of how content was put into our site. And we, uh, we kind of used a, a really wonderful expression engine content management system for uh, our, our basis of our site, which let me kind of step back from actually building the site and let our content folks dive in and start to kind of put in categorized content for you know the law school, the business school, and so on, uh, which was all kind of built and generated along the way in parallel with the actual construction of the physical site. So, so it was, it was in, in, you know, shorter terms, it was a bigger collaboration sort of all across the process and all across channels that kind of got us to a point of having lots of content that was um, then used to kind of populate the uh, homepage state of our site. So yeah. it, it was a process. You know, a, lot, a lot of things happened at once, but a lot of things actually came together at the end at the right time. And, and I guess a lot of things have to sort of continue to happen, right? Uh, so one of the things about creating the house, I love the house analogy, uh, you know, and now you've got to put the furniture in it, which is the content. 
But in this particular case, it's not furniture that you're going to the store to buy for yourself. You actually have to rely on the neighbors to donate it uh, or the people in the online community, if you will, in order to, to you know, keep the site continuously flowing fresh uh, with interesting content to share. Have you noticed anything in terms of um, what's garnering the momentum uh, for the site? What content people are getting into? Is there are there ha is the hashtag working? Have you tried to foster the momentum with that at all? Yeah. So uh, getting back to your point uh, first about the house and the idea of building the house and furnishing it, it, it's true that you know for that first open house, which was the launch of the campaign, we sort of had all the new furniture and we had all the uh, the new components and paintings on the walls but the next day and even the next you know few hours we started to consider what the new coat of paint was going to be because that's the social content and that was the way that you know in 30 days you know you, you felt you can kind of keep keep the uh, momentum of the site going and keep it fresh and keep it serendipitous in terms of what people could explore or discover that was different today that wasn't there you know 30 days ago and what we have had some very good um, sort of timing with, and, and not luck, but just sort of planning, was that the campaign, although it launched on September 29th last year, has been sort of visiting uh, cities around the country where sort of we have large amounts of alumni and, and residents. And we've been kind of having many launch events in those areas. And these, these regional events, which we've been calling Duke Ford on the Road, have been great points in time where we've been able to kind of, you know, roll up with our e-communications campaign and kind of talk about in our in our sort of social channels about what's going to happen, and 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 discuss a little bit in terms of content what the presentations will be when people get there, and and subsequently when we get there, you have the ability on our website to kind of, you know, do your Instagram photo or your or your Twitter feed. And, and, and we can reflect back on the website almost simultaneously. You know, we do curate content. I might get to that in a minute. The the uh, um, the happenings of that day. So we are relying uh, on on our Duke Ford hashtag for that kind of content, where we're talking about events at a certain point in time at a regional event. We're also looking at hashtag content uh, on a fairly frequent basis from, from Duke itself. So the Duke Ford hashtag and the Duke hashtag are two hashtags that we sort of look at across Instagram and Twitter. And uh, of course, Vine is in there too. And uh, Facebook to some degree, but not as much since that's kind of new. To kind of harvest everything on an almost daily basis and, and, and spend some time looking through the content and understanding what we'd like to curate back out to our website and sort of either categorize or to a law school or to a business school or just kind of put it straight out to our main homepage. And, and that's, a, that's, you know, frankly, that is a, a daily, if not other other day task for someone on our communications team. But it, it, it's the only way to really do it and kind of maintain a freshness. And, and all that integrates with uh, any new content we may be putting out that's about the campaign itself. So there's kind of a serendipitous exploration of, of a lot of things at one time, which kind of actually infinitely scrolls back in time. So if you can go down our homepage and see the tiles, you can go all the way back to September 2012 and get this whole sort of timeline of activity. And back to your question about hashtagging, and, and I'll... And I'll kind of run on that a little bit. It's a challenge. I think we've had regional events that we've really talked about coming up, like we'll be having something in Chicago and Los Angeles in November. Those things allow us to kind of get the word out a little bit more focused and a little bit more targeted and kind of spike maybe our social activity at any given time. But the idea that day in, day out, we see this sort of steady flow of hashtag content about Duke Ford has, has, has been something we've been addressing and been successful with. We'd like to be more successful with it. So we'll be looking at, over time at different things at different points in time where it's almost like an EKG. Like what's that heartbeat in November that will be the, the social channel communications thing that may drive more hashtag usage and maybe that'll drive more content that we could use on our website to talk about Duke Ford and its impact. But um, you know, we're still in the early stages of planning out what those heartbeats will be for the next six to eight months, but that's kind of how we're looking at it because I think that 
spike is typically for us an experience that we see happening with our hashtags. So long story short, it's kind of an ongoing process, but um, lots of opportunities to do things that we can reflect back through the website and other places fairly fairly quickly if we want to. That's great. And, and I think um, you know one of the things I wanted to make sure we provided the viewers the opportunity to have today is for you to sort of um, give everyone a, a test drive on the, the Duke Forward site to offer some insights, uh, some tips, and some feedback about generating the site. And um, if you wouldn't mind, Tom, maybe uh, you could use uh, yeah. the screen, screen share and um, take everybody for a little ride. Sure can. Sure can. Everybody, Fantastic. Everybody buckle your virtual seat belts. And we'll the beauty see. of technology, right? You can share your website with uh, all the viewers. I know. On the Internet. How about that? How about it? Okay, uh, I, I think you all there it is. Good. can see it now. Is that correct? Okay, good. Yeah. So this is dukeforward.duke.edu. This is our Duke Forward website. And this is our home page that we publish and talk about and use in most of our materials. And this is kind of, you know, the starting point for not only the Duke Forward content, but also the place where we integrated all our previous content in terms of you know, the Duke Annual Fund, uh, things about our gift planning resources, uh, things that have to do with news and uh, information about our on-the-road events. So it's, it's kind of a, a, a blend, right? We, we, it wasn't just about the campaign for us, I should say this too. It was more about the Duke Ford campaign, Duke Ford website, and the integration of all my previous giving to Duke website content. So we had, you know, more than one mission to accomplish with this and and then this was sort of part of the bigger nut we had to crack was how do we do that. I'll just talk about Duke Forward because, you know, a website people understand and I, I don't know anyone could explore that deeper as they would like to. So dukeforward.edu, you know, this lower component where you start looking at exploring the campaign by school unit or priority represents at any given time uh, tiled content that really talks about Duke, Duke Forward, the impact of Duke Forward, and how it all sort of comes together. And, and, and the idea of windows in the campaign really kind of repeats a little bit because you start to see these panes kind of like of content, window panes, that all have things to do with Duke Forward. Um, we've got sort of our social channel content indicated by icons and uh, these are Instagram icons that we just had last week, you know, the new Baldwin Theater renovation open and people can click on these, see a bigger image, get an idea of what that Instagram photo comment may be if they want to look at it more closely and just kind of scroll through the site and see that. Um, people can post their tweets with appropriate hashtags, we'll pick those up too. A man named Ryan Catherwood here has tweeted about Advancement Live today, so that's front and center on our site right now. And we're starting to kind of just you know, integrate all that content into kind of like an infinite scroll. And uh, it comes together with content that we've worked internally with to kind of create about Duke Ford's campaign. And that's a little vague because I got a little sort of jumbled. But the idea is here's a wonderful picture of Duke Chapel on Instagram. And right next to it, we've got sort of a piece here about the energy initiative at Duke and a little bit about philanthropic support for that that uh, some Duke alumni have, have, have worked to support. So you can tap on those tiles and get sort of an extended story of something that may be of interest to you. And those things of course are shareable across the, uh, across the social channels. Uh, you can also kind of dive in deeper on things that have to do with our on the road events. Like this is a a tile that talks about our upcoming events on the road. So you get the idea that as you go back in time, you can see and understand a lot of content about Duke Forward from a lot of different ways. And I should talk a little bit about the uh, exploring the campaign filter bar. And this is somewhere someone can go look at a number of different ways. And this goes back to the idea of windows into the campaign. Say you're a, a Pratt School of Engineering grad and you'd like to see more about Duke Ford and how it impacts the Pratt School. You can explore the campaign by the Pratt School and you'll have a new set of tiles and content on the home page that really talk specifically about what the Pratt School is doing and how they are involved in Duke Ford and how we're supporting the Pratt School through 
activities and, and things happening in the Duke Ford campaign. So that, that's kind of it in a nutshell. And, and, and I think as, you know, as we go forward, we, we look towards the, uh, the sort of event times around like our sort of regional events and, and, and campaign launches to really engage through volunteer committees and uh, volunteers who are come together to help publicize the events to kind of help us sort of stoke the content a little bit. And, and you know, as we go forward, we'll, we'll see those things start coming up on our website in different areas, our on the road page, talk specifically about our Duke Ford events on the road. We've got some geolocation in there too, but also have information about how to register for an upcoming event and start to talk a little bit more about what events might have happened. And, and, and here's a great example of content about something we did in Washington uh, uh, earlier this year. And, and, and these tiles are all about sort of on the road content and talk a little bit more about how Duke Ford is kind of coming to your town and, and visiting with, with the alumni group that is in a particular area. So but that's kind of, you know, in a nutshell, you know, the nickel tour. There, there are definitely deeper sections and definitely things that are sort of more standard core content like the uh, pages about our case statement for the campaign and things like that. And those are represented much more in a typical web page version, but are still, you know, a fairly robust component of the website itself. And um, they don't integrate as much with the social media and the tile component, but they uh, do present the campaign probably, you know, in a way that somebody may want to understand it a little bit more comprehensively that's not sort of all the windows at once, but maybe it's just sort of the core content about the campaign. And um, as I say, that in, in, a, in a nickel nickel tour, that's kind of how the website puts together. And I really would encourage people to go back and take a look at it and explore it at their own time and leisure to kind of really see the depth of it. Because it's hard to really portray how much is really there uh, <coughs> in a few minutes. But it's very... Um, very easy to sit on a tablet, even like an iPad, and just kind of go through, and tap, tap through a number of tiles, and and check out what the campaign is about and how we presented it. Very good, very good. Thanks, Tom. That was a, an, an amazing test drive uh, through the site. And um, you know, the idea of Duke Forward and looking at sort of the commu online community generated content, the way that you guys have uh, displayed and curated on the site, really got me thinking more about the idea of crowdsourcing. Uh, and I wanted to introduce uh, my next guest again. Uh, Darren Brabham is the assistant professor at the Annenberg School uh, for Communications and Journalism at the University of Southern California. Uh, and he was one of the first ac uh, academics to, to publish about the word crowdsourcing. And his book, uh, which I actually have a screen share of on my desktop, <coughs> there it is. A and uh, it's now in, his, in its second printing. Uh, but uh, Darren, how's it going out there? You feeling okay? It's good, yeah. I just, <laughs> I just got something in my throat. So I've been coughing for the last minute. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's, um, okay. that's okay. A um, rebound. Yeah, we're glad, we're glad you could join us today to talk about crowdsourcing a little bit. Uh, can, you, can you give everybody sort of an idea of what exactly crowdsourcing is and, and also what it is not? When I was sort of reading up about it, I thought I knew exactly what it was, but it, it's a little more nuanced than I thought, perhaps. Yeah, so, you know, to preface this, like, crowdsourcing is um, it, definitely something that I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to define where the boundaries are on it, um, and there's not really consensus yet among academics as to what counts as crowdsourcing and what doesn't, and certainly not in the popular press either. So you might read a blog that's all about crowdsourcing, that lumps in a bunch of uh, case studies that maybe I don't agree or crowdsourcing. So the way I, I define it is crowdsourcing is an online distributed problem solving and production model that uses the collective intelligence of online communities to serve an organization's purpose. Um, so essentially an organization turns to an online community that they probably have created themselves um, and asks them to solve problems, to design products, to innovate products, um, or to give their input on a policy and so on. Um, so really what it is, it's a shared top-down and bottom-up process um, that, that in the kind of a meeting in the middle of, of co-creating these, these new ideas and this new content, that's really where crowdsourcing lies. And so what doesn't count as crowdsourcing, in my opinion, would be um, sites like Wikipedia, which are often uh, lumped in with crowdsourcing. Um, and the, the reason is, is at Wikipedia, 
um, you know, the Wikimedia Foundation is not telling users that, you know, you need to go out and write this article about the Civil War, and it needs to be written in this format, and it needs to be done by this time. Um, what happens is Wikipedia provides this really great playground, and then the community from the bottom up self-organizes and decides what articles need to be written and polices how those things are written. So while there's quite a bit of framework um, provided by Wikipedia, and there certainly is a pretty rabid uh, Wikipedian community that polices itself, there's not really that top-down managed directive from Wikipedia on what to actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, open source software projects like Firefox um, and so on, those, those also kind of are much like Wikipedia. There's a lot of framework, um, but there's not a day-to-day -day directive from the top down. Those directives come from the communities themselves. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, what also is not crowdsourcing, in my opinion, are when you see um, the Choose the Next Flavor contests that a lot of um, uh, food manufacturers will put out. You know, Doritos is pretty, Doritos and the whole PepsiCo kind of uh, universe is, is pretty known for this. Um, and what they'll do is they'll, you know, they'll say, um, you know, we, we've got three new flavors that we're thinking about making permanent. Which one of these flavors do you want? And they just take a simple vote among an online community. To me, there's not enough bottom-up. Um, that's almost too top-down. The, the choices have been decided. And the activity of making it seem like a, a crowd-involved thing are really just for, for, for show, um, for marketing. Now, if you turn to the crowd and you ask them to actually come up with the new flavors and also pick amongst themselves what flavors they want to see produced, then you start getting into crowdsourcing because the, the crowd is actually responsible for generating some of the ideas as well as sorting through them. So it's, you know, at, at the risk of it sounding too Goldilocks, I see crowdsourcing kind of in between these two extremes of too much bottom up and too much top down. Um, and it's really this kind of nice balance in between that happens. So uh, if I can take a, a, a little turn here from our, obviously we've got some topics I want to discuss, but you just kind of look through at the Duke Forward site and there's a lot of the elements in play here. The online community, there's sort of a business need when it comes to obviously the engagement and the, and the, and the fundraising. Is this an example of crowdsourcing? Is it sort of almost but not quite? I mean, how would you sort of frame it up? Well, it could be. I guess let me ask a little bit more detail. So who you're, you're putting out kind of a, an ongoing call for this content? And then uh, you're, or no? Go ahead. Yeah, it, it is an ongoing call. Uh, I, I think that uh, we do a lot to encourage it, but it's not mm -hmm. something every day we'll turn around and say, like, please uh, do something with a Duke Ford hashtag. I think we're sort of looking for a more serendipitous approach to it. Mm -hmm. But um, in general... Uh, our ongoing our calls are centered around certain goals that we're you know identifying as we go along. Yeah, well, and so it, you know it, it may count as crowdsourcing, right? By by my my kind of strict academic definitions. Um, but I guess I want to I would emphasize that while I I spend a lot of time defining these kind of academic divisions to help research become more clear. In the in the scheme of things, there are a lot of different approaches that deal with online communities. Um, whether they count as crowdsourcing or they're more like Wikipedia or they're more like you know YouTube or whatever, um, they're all very valuable. And so it's it's really great to see um, institutions using all of these approaches, these hybrid approaches, these borderline approaches, whatever they might be, um, to do this really great innovative stuff. So I I mean, I'd have to kind of yeah. study it and give an appraisal, but it, it sounds crowdsourcing enough to me. Well, and, and obviously that was sort of, uh, I realized we had sort of this opportunity we hadn't explored here to kind of talk through the site we just looked at, and mm -hmm. it would uh, probably not have, uh, not seizing the opportunity probably wouldn't have been uh, a good for our viewers, but so the idea of the open source, right, the Wikipedia, is not necessarily crowdsourcing because it's not top-down, right? It's, it's totally bottom-up, uh, user-generated. So how much guidance or control must a business or entity apply when they're asking the crowd to solve a problem? I and mean, when it, when's it too much? Or where's the middle space, if you will? Yeah, and I, and this is where you know it's it's really this is where we turn to case studies to kind of guide us um, what's worked and what hasn't. And um, you know some of the cases where this has really worked really illustrate the the kind of balance here. So um, one of the companies that's been doing crowdsourcing for a long time, it's held up as one of the exemplar cases, would be Threadless.com. Um, and this is a, a t-shirt design clothing company um, where the the site, threadless.com, all they do is crowdsourcing. This is the, the heart of their business. Um, they have an ongoing call for submissions for graphic designs for silkscreen t-shirts. Um, and it'd be one thing if they just said submit clothing ideas. 
that would be a problem because it's too open, it's too vague, there's not enough directive, and so they end up getting kind of a wide range of junk that might not be technically possible to make. Um, but instead what they do is they provide enough framework and enough specificity on the problem um, that users can submit, you know, reliably within a certain expected framework. So what they do is they, you can go to the site and say, I want to submit a t-shirt design. You download a template into Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop, um, and then you can design within a preset, you know, template pattern, uh, as well as all the ink colors that are available um, in the palette. So you kind of get a template to work within, um, and then you upload it to the site, and everything's very standardized. And then the community um, can vote among themselves on their favorite t-shirts, and the highest rated t-shirts every, every week get pulled down and printed up and sold back to the community. So it's a way for Threadless to avoid having to print up shirts and hope they sell. Um, it's a pretty efficient model for them. It integrates the feedback marketing research mm -hmm. loop into production. Um, but in that situation, what you're seeing is a much more constrained problem-solving environment, um, which is kind of the technical way of saying they give enough guidance um, to where they can get what they want, but they leave it open enough that you know within that, that container, you can have all sorts of possibilities. So it needs to be something where an organization has defined the problem really specifically and knows exactly what kind of information they're wanting um, and then provides uh, tools and frameworks, templates, guidelines, rules, whatever, um, to users to submit back solutions or ideas. Um, so as long as there's kind of a, those two things in place, you're going to get um, pretty good results. Yeah, I mean, when I think about the idea of, of crowdsourcing, I, I definitely think about openness and, and guidance, right? I think a key component of crowdsourcing is the ability to take a different approach to, if, if you're relying on user uh, online community content, maybe it doesn't use the right tone that you might use, you know, author internally. It's the, it's the openness to take that user-generated or online community-generated content and actually share it up and out uh, and have it be part of the problem-solving mechanism. Um, and so one of the th interesting components about what I was, when I was reading uh, some of your book was to be thinking about crowdsourcing. Uh, and I know crowdsourcing is a huge topic. My colleague uh, Andrew Gosen uh, routinely uh, hosts shows about the topic of crowdsourcing. Can you talk a little bit about how, uh, I'm sorry, crowdfunding is, is a connection, obviously, uh, between uh, uh, Andrew's, uh, some of his most recent shows. Can you talk a little bit about the idea of the connection between crowdsourcing and crowdfunding uh, for yeah. the viewers? Yeah, sure. So they share, they share a lot in common in their name, which is why uh, they get lumped together. And actually, they have a lot in common. Um, again, you know, academically, I would distinguish the two, and here's why. Um, for crowdsourcing, you have a you know bottom up, top down meeting in the middle to co-create new things or to 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 collectively analyze data or whatever it might be that the task is um, happens to make that idea happen in the first place. You're using the crowd's intellect or or work to get something to happen, um, you know, to create it. With crowdfunding, you already have a, a pretty well formed idea, and what you're seeking is funding to bring that idea to market. And so um, you use an online community's micro contributions, or maybe not so micro, but you use their financial contributions to bring that idea into being. Um, but you're not actually asking the crowd to contribute to that idea. And again, there are hybrids. I mean, there, there are some Kickstarter campaigns that, um, you know, they're trying to make a movie. They want some funding to, to produce their movie. They may offer, you know, if you donate $10,000, we'll make you an executive producer and you get to write one of the character's lines. I mean, then you kind of end up with these hybrid scenarios where people are funding it and creating it. But by and large, what you see on sites like Kickstarter and Indiegogo and all these crowdfunding uh, platforms is an artist has an idea for what they want or an inventor has an idea, um, and what they're seeking is funding to make that prototype happen or to make that final product happen. Um, so that's the distinction. Now, they're both useful for higher education um, in many ways, and we can talk about that if you'd like. Yeah, that's an interesting point, that Darren, because I know at one point early on we were talking a little bit about how do you do things differently, and the idea that you just mentioned of Kickstarter coming up was an interesting one. It's like, mm -hmm. is there a priority or something that you can create a Kickstarter program around to fund? And, you know, that gets into the weeds with different issues, but it kind of was a, an unorthodox way to, to achieve a goal uh, that, that, you know, it's, that's not just sending out a postcard about something. So Yeah. Yeah, I think people... Um People tend to like it. I mean, I, I haven't, uh, you know, turned my 
laser beam in the crowdfunding direction, direction as much, but some scholars have um, in business and other disciplines, and they're finding that, that people contribute for these really interesting reasons. Um, you know, they believe in an idea that might not have otherwise been, been fundable through mainstream mm -hmm. channels, mm -hmm. so it's kind of an indie spirit. Um, some people do it because they just are, you know, they feel like investors in a way. They kind of want to be the shark tank people and, and choose mm -hmm. which things can come to market. So the motivations research behind that is, is starting to come out pretty, it's pretty fascinating. Well, and that's actually sort of a, a great frame up for why I, I wanted to deviate a little bit, ask you about crowdfunding as it relates to crowdsourcing so that we could circle back and talk a little bit more about stewardship. So wh what's sort of the motivation, and you sort of touched on it there, that why people get involved uh, in crowdsourcing campaigns and, and uh, I think you know crowdfunding campaigns, there's a definite connection there. Uh, and how do we, if we deploy a crowdsourcing or crowdfunding campaign, really start to think about stewardship, thanking people for their, uh, for their efforts and really sort of fostering a continual uh, crowdsourcing dynamic? Um, yeah, this uh, this idea of what you know, how do you, the big question I always get when I talk about crowdsourcing is, okay, well, how do you do it? You know, how do you actually make an online community happen, and how do you keep that online community going? Um, and there's a lot to be learned, I think, from the public relations discipline on how to cultivate these online communities and keep them sustained and avert crisis when they start to revolt. Um, there's a lot to be learned in those in those ways. We, we've gone these routes before. Um, and there's decades now of experience with online community management um, that need to be kind of brought back up now that crowdsourcing and crowdfunding are so popular. Um, but in terms of what, what we're finding in research is, is people are motivated to participate for a variety of reasons, which I know is kind of an unhelpful answer, um, but it really depends on, on the situation. So some of these sites, these crowdsourcing sites, these companies, um, they'll offer a cash prize to a winner. You know, so that's Threadless, for instance. If you win the t-shirt design, you get a couple thousand dollars in cash, you know, in exchange for Threadless then printing your shirt and selling it and making millions of cash. Um, but there's a prize mechanism. Um, so at Threadless, for instance, some people are motivated by the money. You know, they want to win that couple thousand dollars because to them, if they're doodling all day, they could win a couple grand on a doodle. That's pretty good. Um, but we're also finding this interesting other layer um, of motivators that, that I think are much more complicated and reflect a trend in the... in in society today about what professionalism means as a digital laborer, um, which is kind of fascinating. And, uh, you know, I have a colleague called uh, at University in New Zealand, um, her and her colleagues, uh, Kathleen Kewen, calls this hope labor. Um, so hope labor, this idea that people are doing work now for the hopes of getting future employment. And that's turned up in a lot of crowdsourcing research as well. You ask uh, people at Threadless and a bunch of other companies you know, why do you do this? And some of them say, well, I, I work as an accountant right now, let's say, um, but I do these graphic design contests um, in order to hopefully build a portfolio of successful submissions so that I can then go get a job as a graphic designer or, or start my own freelance firm as a graphic designer. So it's this hope for something more. Um, and those are all kind of financially driven, kind of extrinsic uh, motivators. Some people do it because it's fun and because they really enjoy it, and it's, it's fun to solve tough problems. Um, at Innocentive, which is a scientific research and development crowdsourcing company, where companies like Eli Lilly and DuPont and so on use this platform to get some of their toughest chemical problems solved, um, and this online community of scientists takes a stab at it, um, a lot of them, you'll find out, will do it because they enjoy solving a tough challenge that corporate R&D departments can't solve. Um, or they do it because you know, they'll put it on their CVs and their resumes, as, a, as, you know, next to publications and patents, they solved an innocentive challenge. So it's something they're really proud of um, in the community among their peers, or they just do it because it's fun. Um, and so there's, it, it really, the, the motivations range, and sometimes there's combinations of them. Um, every site has kind of a driving motivator, um, and usually has a variety of clusters within the site that are driven by different things. Um, so what's, what makes this challenging is that if, you know, if Duke were going to do a, a big crowdsourcing campaign where you have content created for a big giving ad campaign, um, some people might be doing it because they have a loyalty to their alma mater. You know, some alumni might enjoy doing it. Some people might do it because they want the fame and fortune of saying that they were picked up in some national giving campaign. Um, you know, some people would do it so that their portfolio looks stronger um, for future video production work, let's say. So the, the problem is you don't really know. Um, what's driving 
individuals unless you ask them. So the best way to do it is just to do a lot of research um, and, and plan for some of those motivators and ways to tap into those. So offer a variety of prize, um, prize packages, right? You might offer a cash prize to the winner, but you also take a lot of effort to thank the, the winners and acknowledge the winners um, and cultivate a community that's friendly among the online community. So a lot of those things have to happen at once. You can't just dangle cash and get a successful result all the time. Fascinating stuff, and I love the idea of, and, and Tom, uh, I'll have to turn this over to you. I know you got a yeah. comment there, but yeah. I love the idea of the, the exposure opportunity that exists. I mean, I think all of us uh, uh, recognize as digital professionals that part of growing within the space is to position yourself as a thought leader. Uh, and, you know, there are various opportunities, and I think there's one here in higher ed to help our alumni position themselves as thought leaders uh, and therefore enhancing their digital brand, their searchable, their searchability on the web uh, when and where others are looking for them, right? And I think that that's a completely underutilized tactic from the institution is to think of user or online community generated content as not just stuff you could share to, to promote your initiatives, but that gives people that digital presence uh, underneath the flag of the institution and gives them uh, sort of that motivation. Uh, Tom, you wanted to add on? Yeah, to yeah that's right. Uh, a couple things. Um, one, I, I agree with that. I think that people really do have an affinity for their institution. And I, I think we discover over time as we go out that people you know, really, really like to see what's happening, and they like to be part of something that's sort of a bigger whole that has some sort of impact to it, and how they can contribute to that really, it, it, you know, I think it, it would make me feel good. I think it makes other people feel good that they're contributing back to something that's a very positive force. Um, so we're, we're seeing that uh, in some sort of more recent type survey type things we've been talking through our people with, that people do like to participate either, you know, by making a gift or, or with time into something that has really sort of a, a specific goal in mind, so to speak. Like, I think the idea that you participate with Duke on a level that's uh, sort of general is great, but the idea that people can participate and say, support a green planet, they, they're able to grab onto that much more readily and feel much more like participating if they can understand they're giving you something that has a real tangible sort of result to it. So, so we're trying to understand how that all starts to come together over time and what that really means in terms of personal content delivery. You know, do, if you've clicked on three tiles throughout the environment, do we tie you into the bigger community of people that like the environment and what is Duke doing with that? So that's one thing I was going to talk about. And the other thing that goes back to taking the crowdsourcing idea and kind of organizing it to kind of extend the community and extend participation. This is a little bit more sort of tangential, but you know, a lot of what we've done around regional events is mobilized volunteer communities and mobilized groups of people to participate in in sort of the, the, the promotion of the event in any way they can in a social channel. And then after you get that community together, our hope and our sort of ambition and to somewhat success has been to kind of maintain that bigger crowdsource community and pull them back into the hole. So you've kind of, at every step, have, have, have taken a group of people that may not have been in, as engaged before an event and now got them engaged through a volunteer kind of crowdsourcing initiative and, and hopefully kind of blow that balloon bigger and pull it back into your whole community afterwards and maintain that tie. And I think that's one area that we're, we're, we're looking at as a sort of a challenge is, you know, through our alumni groups and things like that, how does that sort of stronger bond people get when they rally around a cause continue into the future with the momentum you'd like to see? And, and, and this whole idea of crowdsourcing Darren talks about sort of ties into what we're talking about, about engagement on sort of alumni side and, and future crowdsourcing things. And how many things can someone be participating in? It's a crowdsourcing thing. It's like not just one, right? It's a few things, but it's not every day either. Maybe it's every month. So there's a lot of components that fit in really nicely with what Darren's talking about. Absolutely. And, and and then there's the localization component of it, right? So you've got these online communities underneath the flag of the university, but then as you have these events around the country, you have those mini communities that are meeting in person at your events, but then you hope that it is further, you know, further established on the web, even representative of a region. 
Well, that's huh? right. Yeah, we kind of t- you take it from from physicality to like a virtual thing, and then how do you kind of translate that? I think that that's that's a that's a nut to crack that you know you're cracking every day practically. Yeah, I know. Well, we're giving it our best uh, crack anyway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Darren, one of the uh, last points I was hoping you could sort of um, talk us through was some of your um, research out there as far as uh, where where is higher education on crowdsourcing? Is is it underutilized, overutilized, somewhere in the middle? Is nobody doing it? Where are we at with crowdsourcing? Um, you know, it seems to be underutilized, uh, but I mean, that would be my opinion on a lot of industries, right? Uh, but I think uh, I think that there have been some efforts to really bring crowdfunding into the higher education discussion, mostly about the high cost of, of tuition and so on, and finding ways for, you know, you read these little stories in the news about so-and-so student started a crowdfunding campaign to afford tuition at a certain school, and had a bunch of people contribute, you know, based on some great thing she made and, and a, an appeal she made. So those things work um, in a way, but they're they're really not about higher education institutions so much as they are a response to the problems that might be plaguing some. Um, but there's been some efforts to uh, create kind of crowdsourced content um, for massive open online classroom classrooms, the MOOCs kind of phenomenon or open courseware. Um, you see some efforts in that way. Some universities have been calling on people to go out and find um, certain content that illustrates, let's say, a principle in physics really well, um, and to bring it back and, and edit it and polish it and submit it back to this this you know um, curriculum that they can use for an online class in physics. And that that to an extent works, um, mm-hmm. and you know, kind of mobilizing an online community to go do that harvesting work or to actually create a lesson you know, that you could use in an online classroom. Um, but that's really kind of, that's mostly all I've ever seen, and, and it might just be that I'm not seeing it, but um, there seems to be a lot of a lot of opportunities for, for higher education to use it. Um, in the IT space, you know, I know this is not in the advancement development space, but in the IT space, plenty of opportunity to use crowdsourcing for distributing help desk functions among um, students on campus who might be savvy enough to help a fellow student um, or... Uh, you know, there's there's mobile apps for reporting uh, potholes and graffiti and other non-emergency issues around cities. C-Click Fix is a good example of that, for instance. So why can't you use that that kind of distributed reporting function in crowdsourcing and, and apply it to a campus? Not only report, um, you know, vandalism and, and other non-emergency issues on campus to a central hub that the public works department can take on, uh, or the campus physical plant can take on, but um, also having people going out and, and doing all sorts of gathering and harvesting and, and reporting, um, reporting on the condition of computer labs or, or library space or that kind of thing. So there are a lot of lot of places, a lot of ways to use crowdsourcing on a campus that are very similar to what's been done in cities and, and by businesses. Um, in the development space, though, I, I think um, you know one of the I guess there's always that question of what kind of you know what kind of appeals are we going to make to people? You know what kind of letters work? What kind of images on brochures work? What kind of video spots work? Um, you could crowdsource that campaign and have people submit ideas um, and do a you know a TV commercial contest very similar to the Doritos Crash the Super Bowl contest. You know and have people submit commercials, rate them. You could have a whole Duke community you know creating things from scratch. And well, I, and to, just to just to just to touch in on that, just to, to go back to our, our office of news and communications plug for them. They just launched last week at our football game the new sort of Duke thirty second uh, informational spot that was crowdsourced. Oh, cool! That's in, good. The, in, in the uh, fall, uh, you know, kudos to them and our multimedia yeah. person. They collected a one day at Duke content, and that content was then rolled back into a multimedia spot that they launched. So, so, cool. you, know, it, you know, it worked. It worked, and I think there's lots of opportunities like that, and the harder note is the advancement side of it, and what do you do with that that really kind of you know, doesn't step on things that may be existing already. Right, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, it can be a Wild West space, you know, that, yeah. that you play in, but it sounds like, you know, uh, institutions like Duke, and I'm sure others are starting to try this, yep. and it's pretty exciting. I, I mean, my, my mind just got blown by the idea of crowdsourcing the language for an a, for your annual giving uh, mm. direct mail or some of the other appeals mm-hmm. that you could that you could establish uh, and and test out, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be no. the be all end all of your of the campaign, but it could be a component, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so that's my that's mind blowing to me and something I think everybody should take a chance uh, and give it a try. Uh, and I think. 
You know, one of, I think uh, the idea of crowdsourcing in my mind is sort of the precursor to event attendance, which is in our sort of realm the precursor to giving. Uh, you know, what we do here at the University of Virginia is try to assess um, the engagement level of someone that's going to an event versus one that down the spectrum is actually going to give to the university. Mm -hmm. But I sort of think, you know, having to actually show up in space and time and volunteer or attend um, could be uh, preceded with the idea of giving time, very short bursts of time, uh, by way of giving content on the web, whether these yeah. are images or photos from, you know, gallery or uh, top ten restaurants you should visit in Seattle, right? And then I could collect all those response, those top ten or advice about a particular area, and when I curate that content, I could have a listing of all the upcoming events in Seattle uh, on the sidebar. You know, so there's a way to actually curate the content, um, whether that's someone who's looking for exposure. You could have a nice author's block with their social media links at the bottom. And then someone's able to position themselves as sort of a local and global thought leader in something, uh, establish their digital brand. And when you have those contributions, then you could actually uh, apply it to their central fundraising record, right? The, and we could pull that back out again. All right. I think that goes back to something we talked about early on is that social engagement or participation in advancement. I think one of the things I was always stuck with me when we worked through our process was that's another form of currency. And, and today that's just you know talking and participating. But in five years, that currency may translate into something you can't even imagine. And, and it's, a, it's a starting point. And it, you know, for, I hate to use the CRM type terms, but you fill that funnel and you fill that pipeline with people who are engaged you go forward and in five years time those people could be leading your next initiative in a campaign or something because they really had a positive experience with their peers in, 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 in a group of people that they really want to be a part of. So that currency of social engagement I think is, is, is a nice, nice greasing of the wheels. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, Darren uh, and Tom, I, I thank you guys both for, for joining the show today as we approach the 2 o'clock hour. A any sort of final thoughts, uh, Tom first and then and Darren? They could be general or, or directly related to crowdsourcing. Darren, you, have any? you go first. Yeah, I had, another, I had another cool idea for how you nice. can use Nice, cool idea. Oh, beautiful. Um, there's, a, there's a really great platform called Amazon Mechanical Turk that kind of takes another type of crowdsourcing that instead of creative contributions you get this distributed micro task labor so some of its kind of mindless labor uh, but it's a way to kind of farm it out for a penny per task I mean it's really in a, uh, inexpensive and it's a platform that you could put on there so if you had for instance reams and reams of, of documents and old photos and so on or just thousands of photos that get snapped at you know Duke events every year you could post those online and you could ask your community of alumni to go in and meta tag those images so that they're easily searchable in the future or to add captions or or whatever um, you could have them go in and and you know transcribe handwritten notes from the 30s I mean whatever it might be you can farm out these micro tasks and that could be the way that they give back so there are some people that just mm -hmm. you know might on their phone on the bus want to go in and do something to help without giving money or, or anything like that. They can volunteer in micro bursts of time. Um, and there's some apps that are trying to get, um, you know, to help nonprofits with that, with language translation too. I mean, if you want to turn something into Vietnamese or something, you might have Duke alumni who know Vietnamese who'd be willing to do that for you. Um, and you can have people contribute. So, you know, there's all sorts of um, potential with crowdsourcing in higher ed. Love the idea of micro volunteering. Absolutely love it. Everyone's everyone's busy. How could you frame up a volunteer opportunity in 15 minutes or less? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Tom. Uh, no, no final thoughts. Just sort of cool. fu future looking things. It's like you know. I think what what what's next after you get everybody together, and what do you do with that when you have the content? And I think that two things that we're challenged with is keeping up with technology. Like last last week, a few days ago, we just integrated so you can, you know, we can have Instagram film on the site. So because that's you know, multimedia is a whole other thing. And that opens up a whole other avenue of like opportunities. Like how do you crowdsource films around certain things? And, and the other point is, I think once you get those communities together, how do you personalize the experience so someone really enjoys it and make it is compelling enough to come back to it? And I think we're starting to understand weighting content towards someone. Like if Darren comes to the site, he probably sees more 
people in crowds, you know, what or whatever, just to kind of make make the experience more more mm -hmm. special to them. And 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 you know, we'll go forward with that. And 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 I'm really looking forward to just engaging the bigger communities as we go forward. So it's all you know progress one way or the other. But nothing happens overnight. It's all always a big think about the bigger ideas. And, and I think it's uh, we're lucky because we have really fun work. I mean, I think that getting the chance to think about um, this sort of stuff for a living is just tremendous. Um, but uh, guys, thanks so much for being on Advancement Live uh, today. I hope that you enjoyed it and we'll come back again another time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen out there in the world of higher ed, uh, thanks again. Tune in next week to uh, the broadcast. My colleague Andrew Grossen will be back uh, 1 p.m. next Tuesday. Uh, put it on your calendar. Thanks a lot, everybody. Signing off here from Charlottesville. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you.